Uh, you just finished your PhD. Yep. Hello. This is a massive, massive accomplishment. <laughs> um, and not only did you just complete and successfully defend uh, your dissertation, you also had to really pivot your dissertation because of COVID. Um, can you tell everybody, what did you decide to, to research for your dissertation and how did COVID impact your research? Because we've had this conversation, but this is a worthwhile story to share. Yeah. Um, so my dissertation was on teaching young kids um, consent skills. And so originally I was going to be conducting it in schools during circle time. Um, and then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so schools were shut down. And so I had to pivot pretty quickly. Uh, and so what I did, and I'm, I'm lucky, I'm a lucky student that was able to transfer my study to telehealth. But I know that a lot of students didn't really have that opportunity, but my study was amenable to telehealth. So I did a quick, I mean, I went to every webinar I could find. I contacted colleagues who had published in that area and they gave me quick rundowns. I was reading like crazy and I shifted my study to be in telehealth. And instead of doing like a multiple baseline in groups of kids um, in circle time, I did it across families. Mm -hmm. And so I had family units that I worked and taught them consent skills. Why did you decide to select the teaching of consent skills? And I think it's important for people to understand you did this with neurotypical populations. Yes. These were, were not children on the autism spectrum. Why did you decide that to, to focus on this? So that's a, that's a big question. So I, I only ask big questions. <laughs> that's a big question because there were a lot of pieces before that. So I'm going to back up a little bit. Feel free. And actually, as women, we know, we talk about issues related to sexual violence, uh, sexual violence in our experiences. And I had recently had a friend who opened up about an experience that she had had. And, you know, that wasn't the first or the last friend that has shared that experience. And I just was kind of sick of it. I was like, you know what? Like, I can do so many things with behavior analysis. I was sort of discovering who I was as a researcher. I was being introduced to all these public health issues. And I was like, okay, well, what can I do about this? And that, as a researcher, that's what I do. I look at the big problems and I'm like, this is a big problem, I wanna solve it or I wanna help in some sort of way. And so I actually had some phenomenal mentors. So Dr. Tara Fahey, she does research and prevention. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Sarah Bloom, she's done stuff with serial mans um, and things like that, um, which provides inoculation potentially for uh, problem behavior. And so I think I had this preventative lens that I kind of borrowed from my mentor. And I said, you know, the, the culture of consent starts much earlier uh, than what you know happens when we're adults. And so I really started thinking about, well, instead of working with adults, um, mostly because IRB would probably, you know, give me a hard time too, but instead of working with adults, why don't I start working with younger kids to talk about consent and not related to sex, but related to just personal boundaries as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, like you have your own space, I have my own space, we're autonomous and you know, if I wanna enter your bubble, I should be asking if you know, someone is entering mine, I can advocate and say yes or no. And so that's sort of how that study came to fruition. Instead of, I didn't wanna be reactive anymore, I wanted to do something that was more preventative to help future generations. How many people were involved in your study? So I had three families and a total of nine children. Participants, okay. Mm -hmm. And can you just kind of briefly outline what were the procedures that you used and what were the outcomes that you were able to obtain the results? Yeah, so I can kind of go in detail just a little bit, but because uh, it's not published. But what I did was I created- We won't tell anyone it's not published yet. And honestly, <laughs> by the time we get done editing, it might be published by then. So okay. there's that too. <laughs> Um, so the procedures were, I created a lesson plan um, and it has components of behavioral skills training mm -hmm. and it has components of video modeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically what I do is I ask the families, uh, what are situations in which you would like your child to be able to advocate for themselves or are hard no's, <laughs> you know, like you, you want your children to say, no, um, I don't want you to enter the space. And so we had a conversation, we had 
um, we talked about different scenarios and something that's pretty interesting and exciting about my studies, all of my participants were black families, um, which just happened by chance. And I was really excited about that. And so one of the scenarios that we talked about was touching hair. Every one of those families was like, we need to teach our children that you can't touch mm -hmm. our hair. Um, so that was a cool part. So once we came up with all of the um, scenarios, I basically fit those scenarios in the lesson plan and we went through, we did behavioral skills training, we had, um, well, components of behavioral skills training, video modeling, and then we had them practice with each other, and then we had assessments to see if they could um, still exhibit those skills. A piece that I did have to leave behind because of COVID was generalization, which kind of sucked. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really excited that I got to do a study in a different format and that I got to kind of pilot what I really want to do. And I think it could still definitely hold some um, important information that I could generalize to a school setting. Are you going to, are you seeking out publication for your dissertation right Absolutely, now? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Or do you have any plans in the future to expand on this research? Or do you think Sarah, Dr. Bloom, might expand on it at USF at all? I think we both might be expanding. I think there's so many ways to go. So I, one of the things that I found in my study were I had a really wide age range. So I had my youngest was two and my oldest was nine. Mm -hmm. And I found that the scenarios that we recreated weren't exactly applicable for all age groups. And so one thing that I would like to do is actually create a curriculum that goes across age groups and groups, right? Because mm -hmm. scenarios from when you're two might not be relevant from when you're nine. And those continue to change as you get older yes. as a teenager into adulthood. And there's also, I feel like, more complexities added on. Um, so I'd like to create a curriculum that is embedded in the school system and is done across time so that you aren't just doing this when you're in preschool and then we don't ever talk about personal boundaries again. Mm -hmm. I want it to be an ongoing process. Mm -hmm. um, I would like also, because I was the main implementer, mm -hmm. like I would love for teachers to be doing this instead of me. Um, I would love for, to format it with parents so parents can have these conversations at home and we can also have it at school mm -hmm. um, because these conversations are so important yes. and it's not one conversation that's going to make the change. Um, so those are some some ways. Well, and then I'll add one one more in there. I think for a lot of us that have specialized in working with people on the autism spectrum or with developmental disabilities, we recognize that especially our female clients are at very, very high risk for sexual assault and abuse. Yeah. Um, and I, I think a criticism of behavior analysis has been that we like drill and kill our kids. And so they, and we're so obsessed with compliance. And so we may inadvertently um, be teaching these kind of like generalized compliance repertoires, um, but not understanding that they're, you know, this might actually prevent someone with autism or developmental disability from being able to either give consent or or really frankly not give it which i think is the, the more important piece and so just to kind of plug that in there for i don't know if it's you or if it's someone else i would i would love to see an expansion of this that really focuses on this population that is so at risk because there's obviously going to be some perhaps very different ways that these lesson plans might be presented whether it's you know more visuals whether it's specific pictures etc but, but that's something that i know is a really big area of concern, yeah. um, especially as we see so many of our young, you know, female clients uh, become teenagers and, and adults and perhaps living in group settings. Because um, I was trying to think, and I don't know if you have this data off the top of your head, it, it was part of your lit review. The first time as a female that I remember someone doing something that made me feel uncomfortable or invading my space. And I want to say for most girls, this is something that occurs. It doesn't happen when you're a teenager. This is like eight or nine, but I don't know if you. It was in my literature review because <laughs> I do my research. I know you do, girl. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was around 10. Okay. I think that was the age that um, uh, girls get their first experience related to sexual violence, sexual assault, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that's another reason why it's so important to start having these conversations mm -hmm. earlier. 
Um, so yeah, and there's at risk, like you're saying, there's groups who are more at risk, whether it's girls, whether it's individuals with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's so many places that this line can kind of go and I'm, I'm kind of excited to see, you know, where things go. Yeah, and, and something that's really emerged as a theme from all of these conversations and interviews that we've had over the last three months is the need for behavior analysis to really be more in the forefront of solving some of these kind of larger problems. I think it's been very easy for us to feel comfortable with the the issues of surrounding autism. And we've done such a tremendous job and obviously there's still continued innovation and research that needs to happen in for that population. Um, but I think COVID and the idea that everything that we're being asked to do right now, these are all behaviors that we're either being asked to not do or do, whether it's social distancing or wearing a mask or avoiding large gatherings. And how do we start focusing more some of our efforts because we know we have this powerful science yeah. um, and we know that we have these tools that can really help people engage in, in meaningful behavior change and sustain uh, those changes. But I, I feel like we're kind of like not at the table. Yeah. Um, and we really need to be. Yeah. So while I was at University of South Florida, a lot of the popul student population that I was teaching was from a whole college of behavioral and community sciences. So I had speech and language students. I had people from public health, beha behavioral health care, psychology. And so when I was trying to teach the science of behavior, I really had to step back and I had to come up with examples that could be applicable to the populations that they wanted to work with. And that's kind of one of the things that's really important to me because I, my, a lot of my experience has been with individuals with autism and I, I love that experience, sure. but I am, I'm, I am interested in expanding and doing things sort of outside of autism and making the changes in place that places that I want to see. So I really preach that to my students. I'm like, you see a problem, even if you've never seen it in a textbook or read it in, a, in an article, think about how you can use the science to make the change. Um, because our, we're like a, we're a bag of tools, mm -hmm. you know, and it can be used for almost anything. So yeah, really go out and do that. Absolutely. Think big. <laughs> You mentioned that you have been able to work with two women that I think are pretty fabulous. Yeah. Tara Famey, uh, Sarah Beth Bloom. If you look at your CV, you clearly have a history of working with very strong female mentors. <laughs> um, is it something that you have purposely chosen? It, was it kind of happenstance? And, and why or why not has this been really crucial for you as you have kind of gone further in your career? Um, so I think... I had a really strong woman in my life, my mother, and I think she has <laughs> just, I've always just been around really strong women, my mom, my aunts, um, cousins, things like that. And I think I just gravitate towards really strong women. I don't know if it's purposeful or that's just where I allocate my responses, right? Um, but I, I love being in that space. I like being around really strong women. I feel like it makes me stronger. We are, we feed off our strength and I feel like there's just so much to learn from each other. Um, I have been super grateful to my mentors and I think one thing that has been really unique about having female mentors, um, especially uh, Dr. Bloom, she actually has us go through this book. It's called Coach's Guide to Being a Coaches, I'm butchering the name, Coach's Guide to Being a Professor as a Female. Mm -hmm. So we really go over issues um, that women might experience uh, navigating academia or even in leadership roles. And so I think that has having female mentors has has been really important part of my success. 